How many of you were ever a student of Kathy Crager's or you worked with Kathy Crager? Okay, well I wanna start with just a couple of stories because this day is in celebration of Kathy and I had so many wonderful experiences over the years with her, but one, that comes to mind when, when Goran was just saying about he met us in Croatia, Kathy really didn't like ordinary life events like eating, sleeping, going for a walk, whatever it was. She always had a vision of what needed to be done along with that. Well, I love to eat and I kind of organize my day around eating. And, um, so when we were in Croatia, I would say to her, we'd get up very early because we'd share a room and Kathy liked to get up at the crack of dawn. So we'd wake at about 5.30 in the morning. And I'd say, Kathy, how about if I walk up to one of the local bakeries and I'll get some buns for us and then I'll bring them back. So on this morning, she said to me, oh no, Nancy, I'm gonna go too. I probably should get out and get some air. So when we got to the bakery, she ordered a dozen and I'm thinking, this is so unlike Kathy to order more than we need. And so when we go back, we each have our one. And then I say, well, will we take these to class with us? She said, no, dear, we're going to use those for the rest of the week so we don't have to waste the time and go get them. My second story of Kathy comes from my, I traveled to India several times with Kathy and we again would stay together when we were there. And uh, Kathy would, you know, because she was tired, not to mention that she was over 80, um, she would need to go to bed at relatively early at night. And so she would retire for the evening about nine o'clock and, and that was fine. And so I would go to bed too because that there was nothing else to do if we weren't working and the lights were out. And so she would then wake about 2, 2.30 in the morning and I'd hear, Nancy, Nancy, are you awake? And I'd come. And uh, she'd say to me something like, well, I'm wide awake. Let's work on that next chapter of the book. And so <laughs> I'd find my computer and I'd turn it on and I'd kind of wipe the sleep out of my eyes and 45 minutes later, she'd say, I'm getting a little tired now. I think I'll go to sleep. And that's how Kathy and I worked. And almost every morning for probably 10 years of my work life, I would turn on my computer and there would be an email from 4.30 in the morning from Kathy Crager on the Cape. Anyway, that's my memories of Kathy are really tied up in her being a caring person and a passionate person. And man, was she a hard worker. So thank you to all of you for being here and thank you for the invitation. We'll move to the next slide and what you'll see here is that I just want to acknowledge that I have worked with a great army of people over the years and I've also had a lot of funding and I want to acknowledge that. I'm a social scientist by training, I'm a Christian by passion, but I earn my bread and butter in a secular institution. And part of what I do is I attempt to get research monies and then my students as well as, as myself do field work and then we write it up and uh, that's just part of the process and thank you for inviting me to talk about it. You'll see on the next slide is sort of an outline of my research program. Obviously I'm not like a Professor uh, Pablo, I don't have 95 slides for you because I don't speak fast enough and my brain doesn't work that quickly. If it did, then I would do it for sure. Uh, but what I have done here is just to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the projects I've been involved in over the years. Many projects having to do with the criminal justice system, advocacy agencies. I'm very interested in the coordinated community response. I've done a lot of work with clergy in various faith traditions over the years. And Barb and I, for several years now, have been looking at the story of men who act abusively. And we've followed for a period of five years religious men who've been incarcerated for domestic violence. We've done uh, case files of 1,200 of those men. And then we followed a group of a little over 50, interviewing them every six months for four years. And we're just finishing up now a book for Oxford University Press called Men Who Batter. So that's just a little bit of an overview of the work that I've been doing. Every Sunday morning, millions of women across Canada, the United States, and indeed around the globe, join together with other believers in congregational life to worship God and to fellowship and study with others of like faith. Amidst the singing, the teaching, the sweet Sunday smiles, there's a very ugly secret. 
Sometimes that secret is disclosed in the pastoral study, together with the fear and the shame and the tears that it creates. Sometimes that secret is whispered to others who inquire of bruises or absences or the look of dismay that can cloud the countenance as well as the eyes. Often it's disclosed one woman to another, hushed, as if speaking the truth out loud would jeopardize the friendship, the trust, or the practical help that's so critical for a victim and her children. As you've heard already today, violence against women is a pervasive reality. It exists in every country of the world. It exists in every faith community, and it exists amongst all people groups. It knows no socioeconomic boundaries. Rich women, poor women, black women, white women, educated women, beautiful women, all women can be potential targets. And of course, governments are beginning to wake up to the reality and money is slowly beginning to trickle to a greater understanding of the problem, to reforming the judicial uh, system to respond more quickly, as well as health and other social services. Yet amidst this growing recognition, where are the churches? Where are the people of deep religious commitment? Why are so many of us still so sound asleep. It's a holy hush, I would argue. It pervades religious organizations, cathedrals, and small churches alike. Leaders as well as followers deny it's happening in their own congregations, and they're unsure of how to respond. As a result, they sweep the issue under the proverbial church carpet. Let's be honest, as the, you see behind me, there's lots of evidence for a holy hush. Let me just give you a few examples from our field work. Most religious leaders do not name the problem of family violence as such. They refer to conflict or disagreements or problems of communication. Hush. Most religious leaders have never visited a transition house in their local area. They don't know the workers there by name, and they couldn't find the phone number if their life depended on it. Hush. Most clergy have never preached a message condemning domestic violence or child abuse or abuse directed towards men. And in fact, in one of our studies, we asked a large number of clergy about this, and about one in four said they had preached that message. In a further study using the same constituency, we asked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of church women, and less than five women had ever heard that message. Hush. Most ministers do not include any information about violence in their premarital counseling packages, and yet our data shows amongst women that when it's raised by the pastor, even in the time of happiness, that woman or man is more likely to go back to their pastor later on when crisis hits at home. Most leaders of youth groups never discuss violence in dating relationships. And yet amongst the data we've collected in church youth groups, if a young woman is sexually assaulted by or there's violence in a dating relationship or there's pressure to have more activity of a sexual nature than she's comfortable with, if he's one of the sheep, she's less likely to tell her mother than if he's one of the goats. Bah. So here's the message there. If you are involved in a church youth group, it is exceedingly important to talk about domestic violence and to give words. How do you say no? How do you say this is enough? How do you say I want to extricate myself from this relationship? When women have been victimized and they come to their faith communities for help, pastors are often reluctant to refer them to outside community sources. Keep it hushed. And sometimes, and this was very surprising to me, religious leaders do not know how to offer spiritual comfort. Like reading passages from the Bible or praying how to pray for strength. 
And here's my challenge, if there's any of the faculty here at Gordon-Conwell today who teach those courses from the Old Testament or the New Testament, think about how courageous it would be to take just one of your lectures and use one of the stories of the New Testament or the Old Testament to talk about domestic violence. Like those four stretcher bearers who bring their friend and go right through the roof. What might that mean if you said that with empowerment in your class as it related to domestic violence? And I think the time has come to be speaking out. I applaud Gordon Conwell for all it's doing, but I push you to move even further. That's not in my text. Yet, <laughs> this is why I talk quickly and then I leave town. Yet there's a rumbling in church closets, in congregational closets that cannot be silenced. It's getting louder all the time, and it's determined to shatter the silence about abuse, particularly in families of faith. When abuse strikes at home in a religious family, many women look first and foremost to their pastor and their congregation for help. Now, if you're here and you work for a community-based agency, that might be hard to believe, but it's true. And so my challenge to you, if you're in a community-based agency and you're sitting here today, is your agency a safe place to say I'm religious? Because it's very easy to say, is the church a safe place to talk about domestic violence? But it has to work both ways if we're going to build bridges. And so my challenge to you, if I come to your agency, can I say I'm a woman of faith? And will that be respected and treated with all of the same kinds of care that saying that I'm a victim of domestic violence would bring? In terms of my own work and the work of those who work with me, in terms of knowledge translation, that's where you take the data that you're collecting from social science sources, and I publish in peer-reviewed journals and write books and get grants, all that kind of stuff. And then you want to make it accessible for a wider audience. We've used stained glass. And so we're going to move ahead to the stained glass story of abuse. We worked with some stained glass artists in a, in a, a place called Cranberry Stained Glass studio to create what I would call the story of abuse told from the point of view of stained glass. And if I could, this is how I would translate what we have learned in our studies with victims of abuse into, um, well, into a beautiful picture. And what you see here is at the very beginning, there is peace. Family, have, uh, family members are different from one another. Different colors represent the diversity. The lines represent connection. In the beginning, there's peace. And almost every woman who I have interviewed in the course of my life, and I've interviewed many, who are survivors of domestic violence, they always want to begin with the first frame, it was good. And then you see the second frame, and that's where the glass is smashed. And you can never rewind the tape to go back to the first one. So if you're a pastor and you're sitting here, what I want to challenge you with from this data is that your interaction is not about rewinding the tape. Your interaction is about walking forward providing resources, helping to pick up what you see as the third pain, what is the, the chaos that surrounds, the, the confusion, the despair, and to move from that third frame to the fourth frame, which is all about rebuilding, identifying from those pieces of my shattered life on the ground, what are two or three of those pieces that can be harnessed in my journey towards healing and wholeness? And then, of course, you see that there's renewal. That's a, a very a distinct stage that women talk about. And then there's beauty and new beginnings. Beauty can be born from brokenness. Jagged pieces of glass that are rough to the touch and, and pierce the skin, they can be reshaped and reconfigured. There is hope. Now, when the language of the spirit infuses the language of contemporary culture, new things can happen. Because the language of the spirit brings comfort to religious victims, and it brings accountability 
religious accountability to offenders. So the language of contemporary culture recognizes such things as safety and empowerment and empathy and justice. And for religious women and men, they, we can weave together the language of the spirit with the language of contemporary world, and that becomes powerful. You see, when religious leaders speak out, they use their moral authority to bring healing and to call those who've acted abusively to accountability. It begins to shatter the holy hush. We move now to think about some stories, and I, I use these as a way, they come from our field work, as a way to help you to see some of the interweaving of this issue. So Mildred's story. Mildred and Russell Jennings, and of course those are fictitious names, they lived one life on the outside and another at home. They were a couple that had five grown children. All of those children had been relatively successful. And this older couple were sliding further and further into debt. Russell uh, hungered after status and power, and he gave little thought to Mildred or her needs. Mildred's mother lived with them. She was shy and retiring by nature. She was very involved in her church, and at home she was overly concerned to please her husband. On the other hand, he tried to control every aspect of her life, who she went to home group with, who she would talk to in the telephone. And when she resisted his control, she would adopt, sorry, when she resisted his control, he would adopt one of two strategies. He would either yell and belittle her, or he would turn silent. And then one night, he flew into a rage and tried to kill her. But you see, Mildred was very forgiving of Russell because she was trying to live a life where she exemplified the scriptural imperative to forgive 70 times 7. Mildred suffered, of course, from low self-esteem, and she, this was compounded by a childhood experience of watching her father treat her mother poorly, a pattern that had occurred between her maternal grandparents as well. Mildred was given two hours to leave the family home forever, together with her mother, and she had no one to call but the pastor. In the aftermath of crisis, she had so many unanswered questions. Where was God at her point of need? Would she be ever forgiven for leaving her husband? And through counseling, what the pastor helped her to see is that she had misguided religious convictions related to forgiveness and suffering. He helped her to see that God was not asking her to ignore the pain of the past, but rather to hold Russell accountable. Then the pastor helped the lawyer to understand why Mildred was so forgiving, because this was frustrating her legal counsel. And in a sense, the pastor was a go-between between between the very spiritual questions that Mildred had and her very, very practical problems. You see, this is a very uh, common scenario in our research to hear about the spiritual needs of religious women in the aftermath of domestic violence. Mildred wanted to maintain the illusion of an intact family. And like so many highly committed religious women, she was reluctant to leave her husband and to seek alternative solutions. In fact, the resources that religious women seek in the aftermath of domestic violence, do differentiate them in part from other women who are abused. They often will be reluctant to seek secular sources of support. Now, that's hard for you to understand if you're working in a secular agency. But for a variety of reasons, Christian women often feel unwelcome. And other religious women, not just Christian women, women of other faith traditions often feel unwelcome. And so the challenge for us if we work in secular organizations is how can we make it more faith friendly? What would it take in order for a Christian woman, a Jewish woman, a Muslim woman, a woman who practices another faith tradition to feel welcome in that space? Again, I'm getting off my text. Turn the page, Nancy, you're getting in trouble. (laughs) 
we'll move on to Ben's story. And this is a bit of the story about men who act abusively. Um, the story of Ben is he had just switched careers and he changed marriage partners. He was 40 years old. He was a teaching science to junior high students. And he lived under the same roof as his wife in a blended situation with their seven children. They fought over a laptop. Interestingly, as their story developed, he was unwilling for his wife to use it and he used his fists as well. He then left the house and she called the police. Uh, they were a very, very religious family, and Ben felt that he was better than any of the other men in the batter intervention program that we were studying, and he used scriptural references to intimidate others. But in this faith-based component of the agency, they could use that language too. So that was a bit of a problem for Ben. And so he wanted to intimidate, but the facilitators knew the religious language, and this dismantled his power. He talked frequently about being unequally yoked with his wife, and that was his way of referring to the fact that they didn't share the same religious worldview. If I had more time, I would tell the story of how they went to several churches, and what Ben wanted the pastor to do was to invoke church discipline against his wife and to make public their woes. And of course, when a pastor wouldn't agree with that plan, they would leave. He felt perfectly empowered to study and interpret the scriptures on his own, and in fact, he felt that most religious leaders didn't have anything much to give to him, except he continued to go week by week. In fact, in one of our interviews, he said to us, well, Joseph, you know, he spent seven years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, and Peter was crucified upside down. I can surely handle this better intervention program. And so that was sort of his attitude uh, toward life. Um, we looked at a number of cases, we looked at over a thousand cases in a batter intervention program to try to understand about the proportion of men who actually complete the program and whether there'd be an add-on for those men for whom there was the involvement of a religious leader in their lives. Barb and I were involved in this work together, and one of the things that we found is that there were, in, this, in this particular study, there was about a 60% chance of completing the 52-week mandated, court-mandated um, intervention program by the man. But if it was a religious man whose religious leader encouraged him to go, that raised up almost 20%. Now, if you're a religious leader sitting here, let me say to you, when you come alongside the criminal justice system and the coordinated community response, your impact can make a huge difference. And I'm not going to say, because it's not true, that working in a collective, coordinated community fashion is always easy. It's challenging when you have many people around the table and people who come from a variety of perspectives, disciplinary training and so on. But when the community coordinated response, when there's a will for that to happen, amazing results can come alongside. And I would say that one of the, you know, many churches talk about wanting to be community connected. Here is a way to be community connected. And you know you can't just march in and say, I want to be part of this, and where's my chair, and I, I want to sit at the head of the table, and this is how I'm doing things. But you need to go in in a way of listening and asking questions. And if you know absolutely nothing about abuse, then you call the shelter and say, could you send me my first batch of information? I'm a quick learner. I'll read this, and then maybe we can go for coffee. And they'll fall off their seats at the shelter. Now, let me just say a little bit about the shelters, and I've just got to find the page where that is. Um, as I'm turning my pages, um, I've learned over the years that you, you know, you just get on a track and you go with it. I would say with religious leaders, I've got a couple of points that I'd really want to stress here about what you can do. You can make a difference by speaking out. And speaking out is about being creative and the right moment. It's not about being a bull in a china shop. 
It's recognizing that when people are vulnerable, you have a word that you can offer and thinking about what that word can be. And maybe that word is, let's go on the RAVE website and let's have a look and see what are some of the resources available in Massachusetts. All of you can take one of our uh, RAVE bookmarks away. It's got our URL in the bottom. We've got lots of resources there. If you're a pastor and you don't know how to pray with someone who's been a, a victim of abuse or who's in the mode of, of surviving what they've experienced, then look on some of the prayers that we've written. We've, we're trying to be exceedingly practical because you know what? When domestic violence hits home, you need emotional support, but you need a lot of practical, practical support. So what's the story from the point of view of workers and secular agencies? And of course, we've interviewed many in our research, and I'm going to use the name of Karen Motts. She's the executive director of a women's shelter in a large metropolitan city. She has accommodation for over 30 women and children at their shelter, and they've also got outreach for others in the community. Her staff is often overworked, and though she's a very reasonable employer, the needs of the community are ever present on her mind. She's caught between the demands of her work, her social work background, stressing the importance of boundaries, and the knowledge and value of self-care for herself and those with whom she work, works. She would like to lead a balanced life. But that's easier to talk about than it is to practice. On the job, there's always fiscal concerns. Most of the money for the daily operations for the shelter come from soft money. There are capital costs. Sometimes those can be obtained. They come from a foundation, but they're for a specific pur purpose. So Karen is always chasing money for needed repairs, for staff, for program enhancements. There's never enough time or enough money for her to actually do her job. But she's very successful at what she does. And where her transition house is located, there are a growing number of immigrant families. And the diversity of women at the shelter reflects these societal changes. It's important to Karen that the shelter be respectful of all women's cultural and religious experiences. But this is very, very difficult at a practical level. Most of her staff does not have specific knowledge that would enable them to talk authoritatively to Muslim women or Jewish women or Mormon women or evangelical women. In fact, highly religious women of any tradition are very difficult for the workers at the shelter. Sometimes there are individual workers who blame the religious backgrounds of the women for the abuse. But Karen has been very diligent in helping her staff to see that many religious leaders do speak out against violence. That's why Karen has been involved in an interfaith committee on domestic violence. Despite her optimism, Karen knows firsthand that not all religious leaders are willing to work with the shelters. Over the years, she has seen many women who've been told to endure abuse in the name of Christ. Other pastors ask abused women not to go to secular agencies for help. This is actually quite common. Still others tell them that they will lose the support of their cultural or religious community if they go outside of the faith community. This is wrong. To be sure, some of the blatant disregard for shelter workers has, and the, the angst between shelter workers and religious staff has lessened in recent years, but it's still there, right beneath the surface. And often it's women's organizations within churches who bridge that gap. It's the women's organizations in churches who notice that there's a room that needs to be repainted at the shelter, or they want to bring in financial resources, or they have a fundraiser for the shelter, or they encourage shelter staff to perhaps come at a women's only event in their churches. But in Karen's experience, it's usually only one woman who wants to build the bridge, and then others come on board. Such contact has opened doors for networking, and it's helped Karen to be able to understand more fully some of the challenges. Now, several leaders in her area ask her to send brochures, and they also ask for advice 
when a woman comes to their congregation. While Karen would describe herself as spiritual, she does not claim to be a religious woman, but her contact with many religious leaders has made her far more comfortable relating to religious women of whatever faith tradition that come to the agency for help. From Karen's point of view, faith and violence cannot be separated in the mind of a religious victim of abuse. And I would just say there that this is an enormous challenge that for both secular agencies and for communities of faith to think about a language that they can use that does not blame the other, to think about strategies that they can employ that will be within the sort of broader mandates of both the, age, the transition house and the church or mosque or, or other house of worship where it might be. You see, religious women can be especially vulnerable when they are abused, for they're very likely to hold the family in high esteem, and they're often likely to consider that separation or divorce is an unsatisfactory option. Thus, a community response needs to include input from faith traditions if it wishes to meet the needs of all of people in a local jurisdiction. When a pastor says abuse is wrong, or another religious leader says abuse is wrong, and a violation of the faith tradition before God, it has a more powerful impact than if a social worker says those same words. But you know what we found amongst all the different constituencies the community agencies work with? They, they, the group that they like to work with least are highly religious people. Because, you see, highly religious people often are not open to new ways of thinking. They're not open to, um, well, entertaining things that might be different than they've thought about before. And sometimes that's augmented by religious leaders who say, you have to keep everything within our faith tradition. For collaborative ventures between churches and community agencies to be successful, what I like to call paving the pathway between the steeple and the shelter, personnel from both paradigms need to recognize that the work needs to go far beyond their own individual proclivities for working together. A cultural language that's devoid of religious symbols and meaning and legitimacy is relatively powerless to alter a religious woman's resolve to stay in a marriage, no matter what the cost. Moreover, curbing violent behavior amongst religious men who believe they are entitled by their tradition to behave this way must include spiritual language condemning the violence and offering religious resources to work for hope and change. Correspondingly, the language of the spirit must also include references to practical resources and secular knowledge. Otherwise, it compromises a victim's need for safety, security, and financial resources to care for herself or for a perpetrator's need for justice and restraint. We now move to the last slide I'm going to show, which is shattering the silence in some ways that we can go about doing this. There's five things that every congregation can do. Number one, you can ensure that safety is the top priority. Place a poster, other information near the pastor's study or the waiting area. Something that says Christian love shouldn't hurt. Probably the most useful money I ever got for the gov from the government of Canada was to place information in church washrooms, and we did that because you see church washrooms are the only place that's really confidential in a church um, because if you put something in the foyer and I pick it up, the prayer chain would have already got my name on the list before I get home from church. So you need to have a way to put information about abuse where women can take it or they can read it and leave it and come back and read page two the next week. And so the church washroom can be your place for that to happen. Also, to identify a Sunday during the calendar year where there would be a bulletin insert with the resources that are available in the local community. Maybe a time, two or three or five minutes in the service where the, the director of the shelter would be introduced or where there would be um, other ways to co-partner with the uh, shelter. I know the one, often local churches in, in our region of the country will do something during Domestic Violence Awareness Month and open up the churches to women who've been there 
there to, who are currently in a shelter environment, or will there be the taking of food or other things, backpacks in September with all the kinds of school supplies that are required, thanks, or not Thanksgiving, well, that would be good too, but um, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, the worst days of the year for women living in a shelter, that's the time as a faith community to reach out all sorts of things. You cannot leave here without at least one practical thing that every single congregation could do. Also, church youth groups, ensuring that there's at least one night each term where you talk about healthy relationships. And one of the things we've developed on our RAVE website, you can have a look at, it's still in its development mode, is what we call the dating game. It's about cartoon characters going on dates and we identify about abuse. And I mean, there's nothing magic about that. It's, it's a group of old women and some old men who've been working on this. We've got this together. But maybe your youth group can do it much better. And that would be a wonderful thing, to use these cartoon characters as a way to talk about the issue. And then premarital counseling. All premarital counseling needs to talk about the issue of domestic violence. And even if it's only for five minutes, and leave it, you know, because obviously there's a lot of other things to discuss as well. But raising the issue means you open up the possibility later on that someone will come back. It's time to shatter the holy hush. It's time to be talking about these things in our community agencies. It's time to be talking about these things in the churches. And I believe the day will come when every seminary student will leave well-equipped to deal with this major social problem. Thank you.